tell you something about Andrew. This is my boy right here. You disrespect him, you're disrespecting me. Inside fighting, shout out to inside fighting. back it is the fight season podcast to me jesse Rowe with inside fighting joined as always by our head writer timothy james aka timmy shoes what is up brother how are you i'm good man glad to be back ready to talk some combat yeah you're uh you're on the road you're not in brazil you're in the states you are you are uh stateside you're you're on the mainland in new york uh just before not we get so into it funny, what not so sunny New York. Yeah, it's, it's snowing over there, you were just telling me. Just a little bit, but it's yeah. enough. I think the first time I've seen snow in six years, five, six years, something like that. The best way to spend your weekend is betting on fighting on Saturday and betting on NFL football on Sunday. That's facts. And Inside Fighting has partnered up with DraftKings, an official partner of the NFL, to get you closer to all the action. And right now, new customers who bet just $5 get $150 of bonus bets instantly just using the promo code Inside Fighting. If you already signed up for DraftKings like me, you get a no sweat bet. Get your bonus bet back. If your same game parlay doesn't hit, get your bonus bet back. And if you're a fan of multiple teams and you want to bet on all of them, combine multiple bets together for a chance at an even bigger payout. Fire. If sports betting is not yet available in your state, not to worry. You can still join in on all the fun with the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code INSIDEFIGHTING. Bet $5. Get $150 of bonus bets instantly. That's promo code INSIDEFIGHTING. Inside fighting. Best in the game. Facts. Coming off the heels of UFC Austin, and it was um, it was obviously we've had like we have a little bit of time to breathe here, but we that was kind of an incredible card. I I don't know how much you yeah. thought of it while you were uh, while, while you've been traveling, but probably the closest thing you're going to get to a pay per view, we which we did talk about on last week's betting show. Closest yep. thing you're going to get to a pay per view for a non for for a non title fight for a fight night. Uh, pretty awesome card. A lot of finishes, a lot of performance bonuses were ga- given out. Uh, some controversial decisions were made by referees. What was your overall take of the card? It was a great card. Um, like you said last week, it was just like one title fight away from being a good, decent pay per view card. And uh, yeah, it really delivered some moments, some not so good moments, you know, some things we got to talk about. Yeah. So let's start first with um, probably the biggest thing that came out of this, which was the Bobby Green versus Jalen Turner fight where Jalen Turner knocks out Bobby Green is pretty much out on the ground, getting ground and pounds. And referee Kerry Hatley just for some reason isn't stopping the fight yep. until Bobby Green is completely out. What were your thoughts on that? Obviously, very late stoppage. Um, you know, I hope. I, I was worried for Bobby. That was my initial reaction because it was like, it was so egregious and, uh, and Bobby wasn't getting up. But when that happens, it's just like, wow, this is thick. This can still happen. You know, it, it sucks. It sucks when it happens. It sucks to see, but uh, I'm glad Bobby's okay. He was getting up. He was talking. There was actually one moment where he gets up immediately and he wants to go talk to uh, Jalen and he was still wobbly and the ref didn't even hold him up. I was like, it was just bad all around. I saw that. We also got our own little bit of footage from there inside the octagon. Um, he was very wobbly walking over to Jalen yeah. Turner, very wobbly. Uh, but I think that's just kind of Bobby Green's style. I just think that he's like, there's a part of him that he's he's such a gamer. He's such a dog. He kind of enjoys this. He's kind of like, he's almost like laughing about the fact that he just got knocked out. I don't want yeah. to say that he's happy about it. But you just know that that's a guy that truly enjoys what he does. But I, I talked to Trey Ogden about uh, his fight. Just uh, um, my most recent episode of Five Minutes for Fighting. He had a fight two weeks ago against Nick Mata, where it's sort of the reverse of it, where his fight was called way too early um, or correctly, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Right. But he had Nick Mata in a submission and uh, he was in a choke. Mata did not tap. However, referee Mike Beltran felt like Mata had gone out because he wasn't responding to, to Beltran's right. commands. Like, hey, show me that you're good. Show me show me something. Show me that you're okay. Didn't move. Ends up pulling him off. 
they end up reversing that call, saying that this is a uh, it's a, it was ruled a no contest, even though it was originally called a win for Trey Ogden. So I asked him about that. And his perspective was obviously he's pissed. He feels like half of his fight purse was basically robbed of him. He feels like there should be repercussions for referees for making these sorts of egregious errors, which we can get into. But he also said that he agrees with Matt Brown's take. You know, Matt Brown, who's tied for the most knockouts in the history of the UFC, which is that I would pr- it was obviously an egregious stoppage. It was a horrible stoppage, but I would prefer the referee gives me a chance to keep fighting, to, to let me go out, give me every opportunity to survive. And I, I wonder, are we uh, is what do you think about that? Because I, I have mixed feelings on this, where what is the referee's job? Is it to protect the fighters? Is it to ensure that we get the most accurate result? Is it somewhere right. in the middle? You're, you're the combat guy. You're the MMA guy. What is your thought on, on how referees are sort of the, these two situations in contrast with each other? Well, I mean, it's hard to say. It's just one, you know, you feel for Trey Ogden because, you know, he's he's missing out on his half his purse, like he says. But it, it the stakes were a little bit different in that situation because I, I don't feel like Mata, you know, he wasn't put at greater risk because of the mistake the ref made. If anything, he was overprotected, right? And then Bobby Green was underprotected. Obviously, the answer is the middle ground. Like, we have to be able to – you know, no one to step in, but with Bobby Green, it was so obvious that it, it, it just, you know, I think that makes it worse just because of how obvious it was. And it sucks for Ogden because he was going to win that fight. I think that's another thing. It's like right. he would have won the decision if, if he didn't get the tap. And uh, I believe Mata actually claimed that I didn't respond to Mike Beltran because I was busy defending. Like he couldn't give a thumbs up or something. But he wasn't, if he wasn't even moving, which was the problem that I had is like, yeah. there wasn't any obvious clear evidence that he was defending. Ogden has a, has a counterpoint to that. And his point was, is that they, this issue is only an issue when it comes to TKOs. Like when you're getting punched, this is not an issue when it comes to being submitted. So like the fact that like if a fight is called early when you're getting punched, like Pereira versus Prohaska, no, yeah, it's controversial, but like nobody's going to really it's not going to be that big of a deal. But when it's a submission, it's like all of a sudden imagine calling the fight early because, of oh, the ground and pound, calling it too early when you're getting punched like Adesanya versus uh, Pereira, their first fight, you know, yeah. on a standing TKO. Why is it any different than when it's a submission? It's still you are finishing the fight. It's still a finish. There's this yeah. disconnect where like the referee, where the world the MMA world. And the referees see submission finishes different than ground and pound or punches, obviously for obvious reasons, because, you know, it's like it's probably more dangerous to be getting repeatedly hit in the head. But it's still the referee calling the fight early, whether it's correct or not. The the result should still stand. Right. I mean, it's like if you're if you call a ground and pound too early, they're not going to overturn it. They only overturn it when it's like a submission. They can they. Technical submission is also uh, uh, an official way to end a fight. I think if the person goes out and they don't tap, it could have been scored that way. And it's also like, it's not like this was early in the fight, right? This happened in the third round. Like with and, two minutes left. Yeah. And and it was clearly going to end one way. And that sort of makes the injustice even, even bigger, right? Because if it had happened yeah. like in the first 30 seconds of the fight, then we'd be like, oh, okay, no contest, just run it back. Now – you know, this way it just sucks even more. Right. All right. So anyways, let's move on really quick. This is a topic very near and dear to your heart. Armand Sarukian made an incredible impression against Benil Dariush, knocks him out in like 63 seconds of the first round. Very impressive. Awesome stuff. I love that. Arm- both Armand and Oliveira knock out Benil Dariush. I think Armand's was a little more emphatic. But the difference is, is that Oliveira was an underdog versus Benil, whereas Armand was a favorite. Both of them are very impressive, but there is talk that Armand should leapfrog Charles Oliveira for the title shot against Islam Makashev. Tell us why they are correct. I'm joking. Tell us why they're wrong, Timmy. Listen, because Oliveira just knocked out Benil Darius. He beat Darius when Darius was on his run on that eight fight win streak. Okay, and he knocked him out in the first round with the head kick. Armin Sayukin's knockout is very impressive, but he hasn't beaten anyone else in the top five. 
Charles Oliveri has literally finished everyone else in the top five. So Islam needs to put this chapter behind him or Charles Oliveira needs to get his belt back. Either way, that's the fight that needs to happen next. And listen, Armin's young. He's 27, right? He's he's, he's going to be in a position for a title shot. We know that fight is an inevitability. It does not have to happen now. Let it happen after the Oliveira fight when the stakes will be even higher for him. I think at this point, you know, he could fight someone like a Dustin Poirier, maybe. I, I, like, I, I, I don't I, think I, it's fit out yet, but Oliveira is next. Armand versus Gaethje would be awesome, too. I yeah. think that would be a yes, good one. Uh, the title, true title eliminator, Armand versus Gaethje, I like. I, um, I, I don't think Gaethje would take that fight. No, he wouldn't. Too much of yeah. a risk. There's no point. He's he's kind of He just beat Poirier with an impressive fashion. I think Gaethje probably should be next. It's so tough, man. There's so many good fighters at lightweight. And uh, you just you just hope that because if Oliveira beats Islam, which is what you're, uh, I'm assuming you think is going to happen, then that fight, then Islam probably gets the rematch because he'd be defending for the third straight time. I don't know. It's it's They'd probably have a trilogy fight. Armand might be waiting for a while, is what I'm saying. Armand might be waiting I- I am really glad that lightweight has a guy like Armin, a younger guy who's who's coming up and he's getting these finishes. He he gave Islam Makachev, you know, a tough fight, um, and um, it's good that we're avoiding a situation with lightweight where there are two guys at the top and then everybody else. You know, we saw yeah. it at middle for a while with uh, Adesanya and Whitaker. We saw it with Usman and Covington at welterweight. And I sort of felt like lightweight's got, getting into that space where it's like we have Islam and we have Oliveira and then there's everyone else. So I'm glad lightweight has some young blood coming up the top. You know, Chandler, Poirier, Gaethje, you know, these guys are a little bit older. They've been at the top, top five for a long time. It's good to have someone new in the mix. So there's no I mean- rush with that's what I'm saying. It, it might it might be a while, but he'll get there eventually. I mean, if Connor if Connor and uh, Chandler actually fight, and Connor oh, yeah. knocks out Chandler, we could be talking about Connor versus Islam too. There are so many possibilities here wow. that that aren't wow. being considered. And Dana White has said that there's like a super fight that's being prepared for 2024. I wonder if it might actually be Connor versus Islam and all of this is moot <laughs> and Chandler just has been waiting for nothing. I, I, I wonder about that, which I think would just break the fucking internet if that fight got announced. But um, either way, we're waiting to find out. I love Armin Saryukin. I think he's great. I think he needs to chill out on, on a costing Bobby Green UFC fighter hotel. But other than that, uh, I think Armand is very impressive. Let me tell you something about Andrew. This is my boy right here. You disrespect him, you're disrespecting me. Inside fighting, shout out to inside fighting.